Good evening. Hello, everyone. So craftsmanship is the quality that comes from creating with passion, care, and attention to detail. With us tonight are craftspeople in their own respective trades. And can each of you talk to us briefly about your respective craft and the general business model on which you support your creative projects, please? Starting with Abdullah, if you'd like. Um, I am trained as an architect. I came back to Kuwait and started teaching at Kuwait University. And then I'm, I, I have two degrees in architecture and photography. So I was teaching in architecture and photography. And I had a passion for um, theater, which stopped when I came back to Kuwait. But then I started working again at Stema al Bassam. Um, after that, I started doing designing jewelry, bags, uh, carpets, costumes for theater. So, you know, I am uh, multitasking. Um, my name is Lubna Saif Abbas, and uh, I'm founder of Yadawi and a co-founder of TypeCal. Uh, I came uh, back to Kuwait uh, after working in the United States. I studied graphic design with a minor in art history and did everything, um, including other, um, other aspects. Uh, and basically, uh, what we do is, is we have, it's a multidisciplinary platform. Um, our business model is, is, is that we um, create seamless experiences where we offer uh, 50 to 60 workshops annually for kids from 3 to 93, and we also provide the materials and the space. And uh, our motto is basically to get people re-engaged, hence why we named it Yedawi. And um, it's my life calling, and this is what I'd like to do um, till the end of my days. Wonderful. Uh, hi, my name is Najib Hayat. I grew up here in Kuwait. I began my brand Ludmila. It's a women's luxury footwear company uh, in 2014. Um, it's all designed by me, and we produce in Italy and sell internationally. I work within hello. I work within the structure of the fashion industry. So essentially, my business model uh, relies mostly on wholesale orders um, by our clients abroad or um, actually all abroad and um, and selling direct uh, which is a new channel that I'm exploring right now because it's especially in fashion you really need to especially in luxury you need to really establish yourself before people trust you enough to purchase directly from you so they really need that association of the of the you know the big stores where you're in on the shelf along with a lot of other luxury designers they trust before they kind of take the step um, yeah, so that's our business model. Um, I'm basically a craftsperson. I, I'm not exact. I'm like, I have a very artisanal craft, but um, it's kind of a story of modern. Um, it's just like a story of modern artisanal craft, like how how to be able to sell them in in the modern world where it's increasingly competitive and very difficult to sustain. Uh, quite local businesses. Uh, Abdullah, talk to us about balancing a teaching position at the College of Architecture and with your line of work in design. I'm actually very lucky, alhamdulillah, to be in this uh, department because I'm daily, constantly surrounded by raw talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Kuwait, alhamdulillah, we are blessed with, with a good number of talented uh, boys and girls uh, that come in. That's and in regards to your students. That's my students. And, and then from there on, um, the, the inspiration is daily, and the inspiration is, and, and your mind is always working. So when I start working on other projects that come along, at some point I was a creative director for MTC yeah. at some point. And, and it, it was just how, how you take the talent, how you take the talent that uh, was given to you by God and, and, and polish it and work on it. And I always tell my students that if... Uh, when God gives you a talent, <clears throat> it's that talent's right for you to use it and, and flourish. Where well, other than that, that why you're not worthy of that particular talent? Why didn't you give it someone else? So it was it was a, a balancing act actually, and it and it and one thing feeds off the other, and it was not. Uh, plus, I'm you know I live in Kuwait and I'm single. Yeah. <laughs> I know, no responsibilities. Yeah. That's amazing. So you can, you know, focus on creative yeah. endeavors. Right? And then, and then be, being mm -hmm. a teacher at the university, I have the luxury 
to accept mm. certain projects and refuse mm. others. Right. Because you have a steady paycheck. Because I have Perfect. a steady paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. That's great to have as a creative. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lubna, can you talk to us more about TypeCal? I just want to go back to um, something that um, Abdullah mentioned and uh, in, uh, to have that luxury to be able to do that is, um, is, a, is a true blessing. So basically with TypeCal, uh, it started um, in a, with a very humble beginning with um, uh, my co-founder uh, and partner in crime, Maryam Husseinia, who is an academic, and she was at the time head of the design department at American University. And so we at Yadawi were starting, uh, focusing on ink on paper and calligraphy. And uh, it's, it, it, I'm very passionate about it because what we saw happening is we were teaching uh, type three uh, brush lettering calligraphy. And I have to say this, uh, there is a skill gap, a huge skill gap. Talent is not enough. Talent is not enough. And it was very clear when we had the type cal uh, people coming and speaking and we had people from Kuwait and from uh, from from all walks of life from all over the world and when the students saw how much time it took for um, for these artists and these designers um, to do the craft and to do the art and the science of it they started realizing this so what happened was is we were do we do this every year we've been doing it now for about five years and Miriam uh, and I kept on saying something else needs to happen. And so we had lovely people like Jasim Nasrallah, who's with us this evening, Farid Abdal, and then another gentleman by the name of Paul Antonio, who said, this is the crazy lady who wants to bring me to Kuwait. He happens to be um, working for the uh, crown, and he's scribed to the queen, and he's been um, working very diligently, and he said he would come to Kuwait. And so what we wanted to do is, is we wanted to challenge and invest in quality of deliverables and to challenge students and creatives to raise the bar. Kuwait has the talent. We need the discipline and we need the innovation. And this is what we've been finding when we were speaking to other people in the community, that there is a gap of skilling and there's a design deficit. And so this is where TypeCal came. Um, and we ha were very lucky because we had people in the community like Zane, who even though we, we came in late in the game, they jumped on board and they really supported what we were doing along with American University and a lot of other people. It's really hard work to bring in world-class people in to work um, really selflessly uh, to do this, and so it's going to be uh, 2021 and uh, two year uh, every two years, and hopefully down the road the next project. I'm glad that it's every two years. Is uh, Kuwait Glass Week, and there's the gentleman who started the glass program, and that's something else that we've introduced. Um, and we're talking about sinaat libdaiya. So the talent is there, but we really need to show people what it takes, not to be with all due respect, um, saying that this is Kuwaiti talent, but we want the talent to be world-class and to be competitive across the globe. And that's really what we want to be talking about. Question, so uh, do you want to make sure to, to have a sustainable kind of local crafts and make them commercially viable internationally? I, I don't, no, that's not the aim. Uh, what happens afterwards, it's, it's market determined. It's what people decide to do, whether they're in Kuwait or whether they're anywhere else. But we need to, to really raise the standards, raise the standards locally, and if people choose to per perform anywhere, then they're able to do so. So you're like planting the seeds and creating the skills? This is a lot of, of skills. seed planting and fertilizing at the stage. So there's a, it's, we're at the incubation period. Mm. Is that why? Um, we, we face the same problem with our students where the, the talent is there, but the discipline is not. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly, um, it's mainly harping on the fact that you know, a drawing does not just appear. No. You know, a model does not just make itself. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's one of, one, one of the, uh, it's a reputation that I have where I, I, I 
refuse to bring in computers into my into any of my studios. It's just computer is a is a drawing tool that you use it when you want to draw. Before that, you need to draw with your hands and you need to color with your hands. I mean, we <laughs> it was a revelation for some of my students just to sit down and color pencil a big drawing. For I mean, just the fact that they had to sit down with a drawing face to face and draw and color it for for that took them you know 18 or 20 hours to and then you know suddenly this this drawing <laughs> became a child of theirs because they've spent that time with it, you know and we are in a in a in, in a in a time where coloring something is just select fill you know and that's it that's all what you need so so the the discipline of of doing something and then doing it again and again and again and again and perfecting it and, and doing models and then that's that's where that's where the direction that I think we should concentrate with at least with my students when they're when they're but also that idea of select fill you can apply it to so many different things yeah. in society yeah, now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like people just think thing we're yeah. gonna take mm -hmm. care of itself. You know, let the algorithm take care of it. Mm -hmm. And it's I think short circuited a lot of creative fields. That's it's short circuited true. them. So and I see much. overlap happening here as well in your initiatives that you start with the students. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Because at the end of the day, yeah, well, I don't have any students. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at the end of the day, um, or at the beginning, really, people ask us, uh, for example, they ask Mohammed and I, they say, can we do the lamp work? Can we, can we do the flame working? And I say, if you can hold a pen. And what we saw specifically in these workshops is that people don't know how to hold a pen. And there are 10 to 15 ways to hold the pen. So the, what we did is, is we had maybe three workshops that were digital out of 15, and all the rest were hand, and working on technique, and that you are immersing yourself. If you want to be good at anything, at anything, you must immerse yourself. And so what happens, and we've been speaking to people in the community, clients and they say, you know, and we see this with the students, they think that they, you know, they did one sketch, two sketches, three sketches, they're not doing horizontal searches, they're not doing vertical, mm -hmm. they're not um, continuously starting with thumbnails and developing. So conceptual development is vital. And so I think that the best way to do it is to start with the students. Mm -hmm. um, I remember growing up and going to public schools in Kuwait, and uh, was, the, was a vital part of the program, and you tie it in with cultural literacy. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important for us to, to um, in, in an Aziz al Qalam, when Qaz, in, in Aziz, not Qaziz, sorry, <laughs> Freudian slip there maybe, um, in an Aziz, it's extremely important for us to get people to understand that if they really want to be good at what they're doing, we move them away from the computers. The computer will not make you a great graphic I mean, you, designer. You, you, you prepare them to go to the computer, I guess, mm -hmm. more than, yeah. you know. But I, there, there's also that whole um, evidence when you use habr al waraq it's there. It's looking. You it's can't more erase tangible. it. You yeah. can't erase it. You can't yeah. go back. You know. And, and there, there, there's a there's a huge uh, responsibility and and, and uh, from you as a person. And I see this with me and with my students. The second you you draw something, it it, 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 it appears. It's there. When you're doing it on the computer, you know you can just erase it. it there, there's 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 a difference in in um, ownership. Of, of the same drawing, whether you're drawing it with, with a pen or not. For me, it's a parallel between, I, I feel like skipping all these steps now in the modern world is giving people a God complex. They, they think that you could just skip steps in so many different other things, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. You take a shortcut, and, and it's like that, per, you know, like um, that old joke, like uh, a Kuwaiti immediately who was born wants to be CEO. So it's that, that kind of also mentality when people, but it's a joke, people approach um, a lot of different types of work with that mentality of like, okay, I have a mastery of this because the, the tool is able to do it for me, you know? I'm able to be a lawyer because I have a good secretary. I'm able to be a, you know, and I feel like this, it or, permeates a lot of aspects of creative. So, uh, like, taking the conversation If you don't back. have the, mm. all of the different steps yeah. there, 
you just don't know how to do it. Okay. So is the problem then technology? I mean, taking the conversation back no. to no. The problem is using the technology as, okay. a, as a crutch. Okay. Yeah. I, if you look at what happened, Yanni, mm. and I, I like to look at things in a historical context and to mm. capture learnings from different cultures all over the world. If you look at, for example, in the 70s and 80s, in the States, they had this thing, oh, hatta hina hani bil Kuwait. We had, they had something called shop. And, you know, and they had allocated huge spaces mm. uh, for this. And then as soon as the computer came, you know, it was trendy and it's still trendy and it'll always be trendy. They eliminated all of these programs and we did the same. Mm. And basically, what we're discovering now, at the end of the day, is, is that we need people to build things and we mm. need people to know how to fix them. Yeah. Yeah. We're creating, we're producing, but we don't have people who can fix things. Well, oh my God, I'm so happy we actually came to this because I, I, <laughs> I said on my Instagram that we were going to talk about robots and we're talking about robots. Well. So uh, basically, like, I think that... Um, Essentially, we're moving towards a society where the human is just like this kind of flesh and bones, like receptacle of, of the limited knowledge. And then we leave the computers and the AI to do everything else. Every single major corporation right now has invested tons of money into AI, every single technology company. We're essentially moving towards a future where we have a robot in our house who's, in, who's uh, guessing our will, you know, doing things for us. We have Alexa already in like... I don't know, like in, in Europe you see the advertisements everywhere, in the US you see the advertisements everywhere. The Amazon Alexa AI robot that you put in your house. So we have robots doing the, people literally, and I think there's a huge, uh, there's a huge chunk of humanity that goes missing when you stop learning how to do things with your body. When you start literally, machine that yeah. doesn't have that doesn't have any limitations that doesn't have anything that pushes back against you right. I think it's a big problem mm. and I think it's it, it, I think I can see it in my field now I don't know if I, I'm sure you had a question for me but yes, I, I can see question. it in my field yeah. now where because of this overload of digital mm. stimulus because of a constant that the digital world is kind of preparing everything for right. us we have algorithms to guess the trends we have so everything is actually circular and mm. nothing is new Right. Literally, there so is, is that the no biggest obstacle in creating yeah, but your own brand? There is no put. No, what is that is? the question? That's the question. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's well, not the biggest of. obstacle in creating creating my own. No, uh, mm. in terms of uh, in what field? Let's in my field. In your field, fashion brand. Yes. International fashion brand because international. Yes. Okay. So no, uh, internationally, it's just because the um, the field has gotten extremely competitive, and the entire fashion industry has sort of rerouted itself. So. Uh, whilst before, for example, um, talent actually did matter, um, it doesn't now. It really doesn't. Because the way that uh, the direction in which fashion is going is essentially to create hype moments and to, let's think of Supreme as the clearest example, uh, Supreme or Off-White, where you create a hype moment and then you drive it as much as possible commercially and then it burns out and no one cares because then you're on to the next thing. And the barrier for entry for those hype moments or those hype brands has gotten so high because the payoff was so high. For example, I'm sure all of you have seen like a super trendy handbag that came out of nowhere on Instagram. I'm just giving a random example. Um, that handbag didn't come out of nowhere. There was an enormous amount of money behind it. There was an enormous amount of content behind it. There was a whole team of 25 people behind it. It's not, this is not craftsmanship. It's not artisanship. It's a, it's a, concerted, highly effective marketing campaign. And then all of the buyers are like, okay, we know we can make, for example, net to porte come in, they say, all right, we know we can make, we can sell around, uh, we can take an order of 500,000 on this brand, like dollars or euro, 500,000 euro, we can, you know, we can sell around, let's say 1 million, 1.2, of this brand. They push it, they push it, they push it, three seasons, everyone's sick of it, ciao, uh, bye. You know? So it's, um, this is kind of the way fashion is going. Like I, I, I'll tell you out of personal experience how I started. Um, I'm not saying my journey has not been disgustingly expensive, it has. But um, I started essentially before all of this Insta cycle took over fashion. When I started uh, with a very famous store in, in the UK, the buy, I had 300 followers on Instagram, nothing. The buyers saw my shoes. I don't know how, but they saw them. And, uh, and they contacted me. I couldn't believe it. I was like, no, no way. This store is actually, this is a prank. 
You know, like I was checking the date. I was like, no way. Then I went and I met them in London. They loved the shoes. They took a small order. I couldn't believe it. I didn't, like, I didn't expect it. I was so young. It was my second season. And uh, they took the shoes because they knew it would work with their clients. They know their clients. They know that this, this kind of thing, this super artisanal, super interesting, almost couture level shoes can work. I had over 50% sell through my first month, which is crazy. But other, like, young brands, especially complete unknowns. With my price point, I was selling boots at 900 pounds. I was selling shoes for 650. It's very high. The artisanship, it sh the work showed. You know, this is, for me, it's very important. The work has to show. I can't just charge a price um, like this, you know, because I think that, oh, people are going to find some status in my, no, it has to be a product of the actual work, the physical, tangible thing in front of you it has to be worth it. Anyway, so, um, and I, I felt this could work. This is the right moment for it, and it did. And the buyers, they, they learned right. Now, I, with this store, my order is 10 times what I started with. It's literally more than, it grew by more than a factor of 10. So they know, but over how long? Five years. Nowadays, you won't find buyers like this. Anyways, those buyers left. And they took me just because they kept seeing the sell-through was quite high. But the business model that all of the stores kind of, which will make your reputation now, it's totally focused on these hype moments. It has nothing to do. So how do you balance do. now? How do you work you, with the market now? There is no now? balance in the fashion industry now. There is no. With quality and, and marketing? Well, quality, nothing. I never give up on that because okay. I think, okay, look, so I came up with a new strategy this year. For a long time, I was very pessimistic, despairing, all of that, like the fashion industry is going nowhere. You know, this is a road to the apocalypse. For fact, everyone's going to get sick of it. It's been democratized too much. There's nothing special anymore. Uh, people essentially were buying brands. They were no longer buying products. But at the end of the day, you put something on your feet. It has to actually look good. It has to actually work. It has to give you something else, especially if you're spending, let's say, 300 KD for a shoe. Why are you spending that much? You know, it's because it has to give you something extra. And I felt like all of the extra that everything I see on the market right now is giving people is momentary status satisfaction. It's the, not even, it, it's, Impulse buying, but I think more strategic than that. People just want the points that they score when people see those things on social media or see, you know, because people have seen them everywhere. Oh, okay, she's with it. She's cool, you know? So I wanted to break this. And I found that once I connect directly with my customers, then it's much easier to communicate this message and they actually see it, you know? So I started doing more direct to consumer, um, but also this required a huge amount of faith. For example, we just had. Um, we just had a show, it was a truck show in 360, sponsored by Tim Dean by 360, called The Magic Circle, and it was very, essentially it was me and two friends who are of the same mentality as I am, like uh, we're all experiencing the fashion industry in the same way. And uh, we create products because I don't look at Instagram before I design. I don't look at what other people are wearing. I don't care about celebrities. I design because I want to communicate something. And my friends are the same. Um, we're all kind of stupid in that way, <laughs> but <laughs> we're not very, uh, not very cunning. So uh, we decided to create a show all together where we could actually sell people products. We could show them up close, this is our world. We didn't use any influencers for our campaign. We didn't uh, try to uh, communicate our message in any way that would like cheapen from the value of our brands. You know? And we wanted to make sure people understand what our world is and understand our product. And we were very successful at this. This is something, yeah. like this kind of, di I, I hate to say disruption because mm -mm. it's so hackneyed, but this kind of uh, disrupting this whole digital nonstop, yeah. making people slow down, like, hey, chill out, come into our yeah. world, hang out for a bit. And so many of the people who came in, they were having conversations, mm -hmm. and it was enormously successful because of that. But am I going to say that's easy to do? No, it took so much effort. Yeah. And that leads well. Um into my next question, yeah. and it's open to everyone, of oh, course. Sorry. So can you briefly describe your clientele and those creatives within the industry that you've worked with and you're looking forward to work with? <laughs> Being the minority, they always throw me under the bus. <laughs> well, um, to me, it's very important for you to, to realize where your limits are. Each one of us have their own limits, and then you accept those limits and you, and you celebrate them. And once that happens, you start looking for people that complete you. 
and complete what is lacking to for for instance i am i am business wise uh, uh, production uh, uh, you know selling uh, uh, any anything you want to you, you want you want you need to know where where you can where you, the end of of your talents is and and with me it was i mean production I, i i did some production myself but then when it came to do jewelry i had a friend of mine who was a jeweler i understood her uh, mm -hmm. she and she understands me so we, design was was easy to do when it came to carpet i went and i saw the different types of of, of carpets and the different types of of uh, of production and i chose a a, a company in um, in turkey that does recycled kilims and the way they do this is they take old kilims they take them apart they they re uh, they bleach them re dye them and reweave them again So since all of my work revolve around um, the use of uh, calligraphy and word and the Arabic word into into art, um, I'm like, good. I'm recycling something that already exists, and I'm choosing a a company that recycles something that already exists. So it was it was that that worked in that in that and for for that uh, manner. When it came back to do the other line of jewelry. Uh, I've a, a, a company that is extremely um, they're niche. They're not. They're not for everyone. Yeah. Do you look for that for those this, types of I companies? Mean, I mean, it was funny. Uh, uh, Some of our for carpets came approached me. Uh, Lotus Art de Vivre had. They wanted to expand, and they and they 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 talked to a couple of designers, and then they realized that what I was doing would fit. Their model. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they, you just have to look around, and 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 they're there. You just have to keep your mind open onto what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, at the beginning, I started doing my own jewelry. I just go to a, a, a someone who does a a wear shahni bil kuwait, and and I would I would tell them what to do. Once I started working with with a jewelry brand, they expanded and and shrunk my 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 the size. And and they used new types of of, uh, of craftsmanship that I would not have, and uh, not have have. So is it of. a conscious decision that you look for these types of people? Uh, one is uh, one is very conscious that you are looking. The conscious part is that your eyes are open and and you and you are you're looking for for that. The the faith part is that they're going to come, yeah. and you're going to find it. Because you're already with them. But yeah, I mean, I mean, to 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 you to use, I mean, to to get these women in Turkey to stop doing kilims that they've been doing for hundreds of years to do something new that has calligraphy. Yeah. And then the second they learned it was calligraphy, they would not touch it because mm. uh, Arabi is the language of Quran, and we're not going to be walking mm. on Quran. And I'm like, it's not. It's a language. We love, we hate, we curse, we do. I mean, you know, it's a language that we use. So, so why not use it in 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 a in a modern in a modern aspect? And right. and because we have moved from al khayma to the house, mm. but the kilim or the sedu didn't do that jump, mm. and we still look at it as i khayma bar Archaic, cheap, yeah. you know. Mm. And I want it to be history. more of artisan, new, contemporary. Right. Why is it rich. important to do that with historical sort of? Um, Because I didn't, we, we didn't come from nowhere. Yeah. And it's good that things develop with us. We mm -hmm. we have this jump, and we we Hasat and Blikwait, we have this jump. I mean, my father went to went from Beit Bsharg, uh, a courtyard house, mm -hmm. went to study, came back to Beit Bishamia, That's modern mm -hmm. concrete. I mean, it was mm -hmm. it was a five year period. Yeah. Where the entire life things shifted. escalate, yeah, and in Kuwait things course. escalated a lot yeah. faster than a lot of other places. Yeah. And and in some cases we we are, I mean, we're fortunate enough that we 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 are catching up a little bit, but we're not. Mm. So so it is it is good to find things that, I mean, because I did two companies. One company was this Sedu Killing one, and one was a German company that does 3D hand cut tufted uh, silk, and it was like very very modern and extremely. Harsh next to the other one, right. which the other one was like soft and you know 
you're hiring women to do this and you're empowering women. It was like two completely different um, avenues. And, and stylistically, I made sure that they are different. Okay. You know, one, is, one talking about sleek, luxurious, you know, fierce almost. The other one is soft and, and, uh, and approachable. You know, so, but I wouldn't, I, if I said I'm going to go and do this by myself, I don't have, I don't have that, that, right. uh, that skill mm -hmm. to do it. Right. Same thing with Judy. I started at the beginning. Same thing with, with costumes. I, the first time I did costumes for Postman, I started cutting myself and doing this. And then I realized, you know what? I have people that could do this a lot better than I am. I've studied cutting so I could at least talk to them. I do right. the patterns. So that's creating a sense of community within the creative definitely, industry. Yeah. Definitely. Giving jobs to people who deserve ha having those jobs, so on. Yeah. Perfect. Livna? Going in back terms of to the, yeah, well, in terms of clientele, it was very interesting because what we, our initial business model has been for the last 12 years mm -hmm. is, is creating these experiences and we were working to two main areas. Uh, the ink on paper, paper crafts, recycling, upcycling, mm -hmm. uh, jewelry, uh, design and making, uh, and now glass. Yeah. And initially, people would come to us and you know, we would say, here you are, you know, DIY, this is how you do it. And we would have clients who would say, no, you do it for us. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, we were like so offended, because you know, our model, we were so stuck to the model. <laughs> and then um, we started you know, producing samples of work, and then mm. people would come in and they say, we want to buy it. We want to mm. buy all this, you know, upcycled deco patch material. The cha and, and going back to the fixing part of it, we have, a, uh, we have a client right now who has traveled all over the world. She's based in Kuwait, and she's working with, uh, with Mohammed and I because she wants to replace um, a, um, a beautiful uh, uh, lampshade, and she can't find anyone to remake a piece that will fit into it. Mm -hmm. So the, th the thing that we're finding, and that's happening now, and it wasn't, we were, we were expecting it, but we're not pushing it. And one of the reasons why we're not pushing it is, is because the whole idea, especially with the, in the glass making uh, side of it, is, is we're we want to educate enough of the local community so that we have enough artisans and technicians or, or assists so that we can start creating this this production unit, uh, and we are like we have our youngest, um, our youngest apprentice, uh, Saud. He's 13 years old, and he works with uh, Mohammed like practically two or three times a week. And so, because of the fact that we're not even at ground zero, we're like, way behind, despite the fact that glass came from this part of the world, Mesopotamia. Mm. Ironic that uh, in that respect. But what? we are finding is, is we actually have clients that are coming to us who are asking for us to produce things and we can't do it not because we don't want to but because we need we have space we today are in Dar al-Athal Islamiyah Yarmouk and we've been very lucky that we were able to find this place because we've been looking for a place for 15 years we worked in the in Yadawi in the basement, mm -hmm. but we couldn't do the glass. Mm -hmm. You've you've seen that setup, and so now we've got we've got all the equipment, and we're ready to to start working. But having a facility where we're not in Amgara or we're not in I don't know like so <laughs> way out, so that our clients can come and they can actually co-design with us. This is this is you know where we're at. But right now, what we have is is we have a demand for production, and we are ready, mm. but we don't have the capacities to deliver as fast as they want and mm. as we want. And this is something that we didn't expect. We weren't expecting to go into the production side so soon, mm. um, and so it's it's a surprise and it's frustrating because we want to do this, mm. but also testing and producing and teaching peop enough people to create that production, artisanal production, excuse me, takes time. And that's really what we're lacking. I need, we yeah. need more time. We need more time to be able to, to hone and fine tune and not mm. go to the market and just shoot yeah. from the hip. That's a great segue to my next question. There's a stereotype that once you produce en masse that you lose the quality or the craftsmanship of the product that you're selling. Do you believe in that? What are your no. thoughts on that issue? What no, do you think? you don't necessarily have to lose mm -hmm. the quality. Uh, 
In what sense? If you look, the stereotype is if you if you do mass production, you uh, lose qualities because you're going to a substandard factory. <laughs> Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if you have all the components necessary to make something of quality, then it doesn't matter if you're making one or a hundred thousand. Mm. It really doesn't. Mm. And anyways, probably the hundred thousand will be a better quality right. because you would have been able to create proprietary molds. You would have been able to invest in all these different things to perfect mm. the product that you cannot invest in when you're just doing one. Right. And you'd have to do it uh, certain elements, by, for example, in my trade, by hand. Mm. Yeah. But oh. um, in in. The 1900s, when the industrial revolution came, right. and and everything that's was that's where the, the stereotype comes from. Yeah, and when the machines yeah. were, were were doing were doing a lot a lot of stuff that, that the artisans used to used to do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, things were easier and they're becoming faster and, yeah. and they're there, but and cheaper a and lot cheaper. cheaper. And yeah. then and then there was a huge movement. In and art it's cheaper and because the materials are cheaper. Mm -hmm. No, no, because you don't hire you're not hiring as and many. And you're not hiring. No, yeah. you can do the same material, but yeah. because you're not hiring as many people to do. It's mm -hmm. Technological revolution. Yeah. yeah. So so then the, then there was a a, a counter proposal mm -hmm. with the arts and crafts movement. Mm -hmm. You know where they went back into hand printed wallpaper right. and and you know and and it was it was a big it was a big comeback. But again, now you go and you buy something, and they tell you this is handmade. Right. Mm -hmm. And if it does, <laughs> if it doesn't look like it's handmade, if it's too perfect, you won't believe mm -mm -mm. it. That's very true. You know, so so there's this there's this this dance that you have to make between, I want something that is handmade, so someone actually spent time with it. At the same time, I don't want any human flaws in the in in the mm -hmm. production. So it, it, it's 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 um, it's it's a it's a dance. Yeah. That you you know, it goes up and down. You know. Yeah. And I think one of the cha one of the challenges, and I definitely think it's a it's a it's a opportunity, is there's a lot of times, where we are here in Kuwait, if people say, well, come and, you know, and, and come in and do this and do the setup, for free. <laughs> You'll get exposure. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> People will know who you are. <laughs> People already know who I am. Like, it's, you know, I don't need you. Trust yeah. me. This is good for you. And how do you deal with that? You just tell them to go away. Uh, uh, this year, <laughs> this year, and this is a debate that we've been having constantly, 12 years now, mm. I call it the art of artfully saying no. Mm -hmm. No to this and yes to something else. And is it not worth explaining to whomever's trying to no, hire you that I need of, to be no, paid? That's, that's, no, that's part of the conversation. Mm. Okay. So when you say no, they go, why? <laughs> and you say, well, because I need to be in the studio, mm. I need to be working, and I would rather be sitting and sketching in my sketchbook because we need you to understand the value of the creative industries. And no, it's not a negotiation. Exactly, mm -hmm. but is it, it, it becomes a problem when the creative industry is dumping product on these mm -hmm. people who want free stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I, for me, the ultimate parasites are I don't, it, like, well, there are lots of parasites in the fashion industry, but let's say there are uh, more in the fashion industry than in other fields. Um, there are a lot of people who just think that, okay, I have a big follower account on Instagram, great, give me something for free. No, what's the return on investment? You're gonna guarantee I'm gonna sell 50 pairs of shoes? Oh, not even half? Go away. I'm not going to give this to you. I'd rather make money, you know, and sell it to someone else. So there, I think, but it, it becomes a problem when these people are given so much attention mm -hmm. by uh, other people in my field just because those are massive companies right. and they have massive PR budgets. Yeah. And they're just dumping product on these guys. And at the end of the day, these people all came into being because young designers were giving them stuff and they were giving exposure at the time when Instagram actually worked and now the conversion rate in Instagram is nothing. Like I'm telling you, nothing. If you think that giving a blogger something is gonna actually make you money, forget about it. Unless it's like uh, some kind of uh, toothpaste or you know, like those charcoal toothpaste, maybe that would work. But if you're talking about a product of value, high value, like, yeah, there's, there's a huge gap between what's actually going on mm -hmm. in the industry of people gifting these people and also a lot of, for example, clients of yours who come in and they want to make big orders, but they're like, yeah, but you're not satisfying X, K, y, X, you know, X, Y, Z requirement. Like, you're not mm -hmm. gifting all of these people. And I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't deliver. So why do you require this yeah. of me? It, it literally, yeah. it doesn't convert for me, doesn't convert for you. 
yeah, but all the other big brands are doing, yeah, but it doesn't convert. Yeah. So it's a failing strategy. Why should I follow a failing strategy? Mm. But then they demand it of you all the same. So you're mm. stuck in this box where you have to do something that doesn't even give you a result, you know? Mm -mm -mm. But because clients want to see yeah. it. So it's mm. like this yeah. weird catch-22 mm -mm. where you're going around in a circle. Right. And I just think that, you know, the rest of the people in this industry should just stop giving them stuff. Yeah. But, but also on the, on the other spectrum, when, when, um, when someone sat down and worked on something they and, and, they, and they made it and then you ask them to give it out for free, mm -hmm. you be are undermining that value of that time. Yeah, you're, they're cheapening you it. Know? That's why and, fashion is uh, so cheap now. No, but, but not even, I'm not talking about the big brands that have yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. multiple. I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a young designer who's just mm -hmm. worked on something and then you're asking them to give it for free. Uh, from a young age, you know, you, 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 start, you start telling them that all the time that you have spent working with this is worth nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, I, and I find that more of, of, dam of a damage yeah. to, 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 to the creative process than anything else when you, when you, you suddenly find, or someone comes and tells you, well, I could go and get the exact same thing, you know, uh, machine made for one fifth of the price. Then go get it, machine made for more. Exactly. <laughs> the price, you know, right. yeah, but also, I just think there's this huge damage in general to what is that. Like, this is a bigger discussion, but what is valued in society exactly? Like, before, you know, you used to have someone famous being an actress, someone who actually had a job, you know, someone who actually, like, they worked hard to reach this point where their art was so valued by society. You know, you've always had hangers on, whatever. You've always had socialized people famous for nothing. But nowadays, people see it as a career path. Yeah. You know, yeah. let me, like, Act kids actually think, how can I build up my Instagram profile? Should I lose 20 kilos to build up my Instagram prof profile? Should I uh, take pictures, for example, they go to weddings and they take pictures, to weddings of other people to boost up their Instagram profile. People literally turning their own weddings into a marketing event. Good God, where are we? You know, where essentially if, if this is what society has come to value, the number mm -hmm. of likes something gets, the, right. the popularity it has, the creative process is ultimately doomed. It's, right. it's, yeah. it's, it's put on the lowest yeah. rung, Good. you know, unless you can get, because when you have a society, I feel sorry for kids now, because when I grew up, I didn't have numbers on my pop popularity, mm -hmm. you know? I didn't have someone telling me, oh, this person is literally, you know, a uh, hundred thousand people more popular than you are. A yeah. hundred thousand points more popular than you right. are. Uh, this, when you feed kids in this kind, on this kind of um, social, uh, social status system, where essentially you're telling them that they should value, their, they should value themselves, their right. lives, their coolness in actual numbers, then we all become numbers. Right. Our, right. our intelligence becomes numbers. Our artistic ability becomes numbers. Our creativity, our ability to deliver becomes numbers. So actual creativity, which is why I, I was pessimistically saying that creativity doesn't matter anymore in fashion. This is why I'm saying because it's all become a numbers game. And if you can't win that game, then what are you even doing here? Yeah. So that's where I, where I really beg to disagree. And saying that because when we come full circle, and that's why we, because of what we're talking about, we, uh, we, ch we had a completely different business model because I was getting to the point where I, uh, I have pieces where there are hundreds of hours made into them and time. And, uh, and the first time that I showcased them was at Salwar Qadi's and some ladies came in and they went, they saw the pieces and, and, um, and they said, oh, هذه المختنيات سلوة, antique. And I told the lady, and that was a conversation. I said, no, and I made it. And she's like, and I was like, no, two beads at a time, thread and a needle. And then, you know, they, they then said, uh, they asked, you know, for the price. And I quoted them the price. And they said, and I said to them, Mumtaz, Ghali compared to what? Mm. And so we started having the conversation, and that conversation, and I said, well, you know, this is, and I showed, and, and Amnira did this at Beit Lothan, I remember vividly. She pulled out her whole studio to show people what the process was to understand. Now, the reason why I beg to differ is, is because, again, you know, when we're talking to, to people who are, and why are you still doing this, and why are you, are you still doing it, is, is because we know 
even though you're the la you could be the last person on earth and there are days when we ask ourselves, why the heck are we doing this? There's a reason why. And that is, is because you are leaving an imprint. And for me, I'm not that egotistical, but I do want to know, 200 years down the road, they're going to excavate Beit Nabil Jabriya, <laughs> and they're oh going to see this meticulous, <laughs> immaculate piece of work that someone did, and they're going to analyze it, and they're going to look at it. So the idea is, is that ink on paper, sorry, ink on paper, the jewelry, um, uh, and I look at it always from an anthropological standpoint and a cultural standpoint, these material elements of our visions, mm. this is what goes beyond that immediacy right. mm. of digitization. Those things, مثل ما أنت تفضلت, remain. They stay, and they go beyond us, and they mm. go, you know, through us as I'm, well. I think my, my take on this is a bit more frivolous. Okay. It's fun. It's a lot of fun, and it is. And is you you finish working on a piece, by the time you're done, you're so satisfied, and you're on this high mm. that nothing else is compared to it. And you go to bed, and you sleep exhausted out of that. I mean, every every time. That's why I I Best literally exhaustion. lose I l lose interest in my piece the f second it's finished. Mm. Then I take then it goes to the seller, and mm. he can take he can take it from right. her. But it, I mean, I, I with me, I'm. I don't think anyone's going to excavate anything from my house at that point. But I think I, 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 I no, no, I care for now. It's it's yeah. a lot of fun. Right. You it you is. cannot you cannot deny the fact if you're having that much pain doing it, then you're a masochist, you know. And we're all masochists at some point. But but working on art, I always tell my students when you come into the school of architecture, you this is this is a star profession. So only few of you are become stars, if any. The rest of you are going to be underpaid. You're going to be. People are not going to understand you, and people are not going to appreciate you. I mean, you know, that's how yeah. it is. But the equivalent of that, your hobby, is your job. It's your livelihood. And very few people can say that. They always say, "Oh, I work like this, but my hobby is that." They, I mean, with architects, with artists, with musicians, they can actually say, "My hobby mm -hmm. is my job," and something has to pay. I mean, you know, there's right. a payment for that. Can right. I ask a question? Yes. Okay, so speaking of this whole excavation, like also wrap in plastic just in case the sea kind of, but uh, <laughs> like, I mean, we're most, we're low lying. So the point is, um, how exactly do your creative endeavors reflect uh, your current reality living in Kuwait? Like what, is what, what, what change have you made? No, no, not what change, like uh, who, I, I what, mean, how many children have you saved? Like what? Uh, what I mean, what, what actual aesthetic change? No, but what what aesthetic? What is the, how how does how do the aesthetics of your products? Of what yeah, you so make how do you reflect? contribute back mm. to yeah. these well, young creatives? I don't creatives. make products. Right. I'm I yeah, your your art pieces. I I am. A but story but you weaver. deal with young students. So yes, we yeah, do. That's contributing. Yes. Well, the thing is for me, especially on those tough days like today. Mm -hmm. Today we, we have a program, well we work with children, but we have a program that we're working on, um, it's called Senate, and, uh, and they're women, they, they, they are considered older, 50 plus, mm -hmm. I'm part of that club. And so, uh, and so when you see these ladies mm -hmm. who are coming in, and uh, they're st you know, they leave with a smile on their face, it's that simple, I know, that mm -hmm. is my calling. Oh. My calling is, and people are saying, well, you're doing art therapy. I, I don't quote that. I don't quote, I'm an artist. I'm a maker. Right. And I make things. And we create moments that people can prolong if they want. It could be immediate. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really that intangible. And as a result of it, uh, four years later, we had the Yedawi Collective. And we had, we had people making things uh, and we ended up having collections shown in various galleries, and and that and it took this kind of um, it, it it became this momentum. Yeah, I was involved at one mm. point with our first open house in Yedawi, and so I yeah I don't say that I'm going to do this really. Right. Right. You 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 know you put all your effort, you do the work, mm. and then what comes out of it is greater than anything I could have planned for. Right. I mean I am. Uh, male, mm. Arab, Muslim. Mm. The worst kind in the media. 
I mean, I'm represented so badly in the media and on mm. every level. So it, it, with me, yeah, every not time here, I, yani, abroad. Every, no, male, Muslim, Arab is always, I mean, just write these three words on the computer and look at what comes up. <laughs> huh? Well, yeah, I, I claim that I am. <laughs> but uh, every single time, I mean, when, when I was, with every single interview I've had, every single interview I've had, every single time I, I have an opening, people walk in and walk out, literally shifting an idea, even a little bit about what a male Arab uh, Muslim could do. Because my first collection was Quran. You know, okay. and 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 it was it was and it was a huge debate with a lot of people. Uh, my car my carpet collection, the first one, got me trend of 2016 by by Architect Digest. So I'm not trendy. I am a trend. <laughs> awesome. You know, you know what I'm saying. So it, it yeah. be, be, but people are still very scared of using calligraphy mm. in that manner. Right. They're just they're, they. I mean, even the ones that bought the carpets are hanging them. Mm. After, after, going through, after going through all the research of what's the perfect size for a living room, what's someone that's sold the most, and it's, and it's two and a half by three and a half. It's a huge carpet, mm, yeah. you know? And people always put it because it's a work of art. Yeah. I'm like, no, work of art is a foreign concept. We, as this part of the world, Arabs, Muslims, whatever you want to call us, we, 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 we are walking on pieces of art, we're sitting on pieces of art, our backs are pieces of art, you know, we don't have the whole concept of... No, I mean, we, no, we don't have the concept of, you know, this is a blank yeah. wall, let's yeah. decorate it with a piece of art. Not in the conventional European yeah. sense of what art is. is. And it has to match the couch. And of course. <laughs> what is the future of craftsmanship? Locally, uh, regionally, internationally? Can I answer it? The Sorry. One before. So, um, I'm always, like, I think it's quite important to reflect um, look, I grew up in the 90s, like essentially all of our textbooks, even the, even the government mandated textbooks and all of the advertisements around Kuwait, they're kind of shoving down our throat this idea that our identity is made of certain components, right? Bar, bahar, um, like uh, desert, sea, uh, camels, um, calligraphy and certain arabesques. I'm so sick of it. I can't, I can't do it anymore. It's not who I am. Like, I, I rode a camel, I was saying the other day on my Instagram, literally in showbiz, like, you know? I didn't ride a camel in the desert. My life has nothing to do with tents. This is not my culture. Stop shoving it down my throat. So I grew up, um, and what I try to communicate with my brand is really, um, if you want to talk about how does this reflect on the Middle East, I grew up in a very uh, female-led house. And um, a lot of my ideas are about kind of a woman a woman unrestricted, you know, I'm very, I grew up in Kuwait in the 90s, I didn't exactly have uh, the greatest, like, aesthetic, um, I didn't have, like, a treasure of, 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 of aesthetics around me, I didn't have wonderful things that were part of my heritage to mine, you know, because essentially our heritage was kind of raised down, wasn't it? and uh, replaced with new things, new buildings, everything shiny, everything modern, and then demolished after five years. So I had to reach elsewhere to get this sense of fantasy um, to allow a place where I allowed my imagination to run free and I would just read and read and read and read hundreds and hundreds of books like obsessively and um, that's where I get a lot of my inspiration from from my brand but also the message that I think relates to the Arabness that's important to communicate is my shoes for example low-heeled um, they're made for a woman to walk, but also to look dramatic. They're very noticeable. The aesthetic is, is strong. It's not limiting, but it's strong. And I think it's an important message coming from the Arab world, and especially from a young Arab brand, from an Arab girl, you know, to be saying, go out, be dramatic, do whatever you want. But you're not on a spectrum of innocent to sexy. You're not on a spectrum of um, masculine to feminine. Just be drama, fun, lights, camera, action, be who you are, you know? And I think the message behind the shoes is very much that because people always ask me, oh, you're trying to design, for, they always say this to me, for the international market. I'm like, no, I'm not designing for international, I'm designing what is inside me. My, and my design is Arab because I am Arab. And don't take away my identity. Don't take away like my history, my growing up in Kuwait in the 90s my recourse to uh, fantasy novels, uh, my um, 
my aesthetic, the miniature paintings that inspired me that are in my house, all of this confluence of themes that came together to produce my product, don't deny me that because I didn't follow some you know, government or socially mandated formula as to what constitutes my Arab identity. I think it's, it's also it's important to have this, that kind of background. I mean, especially when they come and tell you this is Islamic art. Well, I don't which, get that, but <laughs> yeah. Which, which is a word that truly bugs me. Yeah, because, because they just put you in a box. You're just no, 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 taking... Because, no, 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 because there's no such thing. There's no Islamic mm -hmm. art, there's no Islamic architecture. Because, I mean, when, I mean, when I'm saying this, I mean, there's not an architecture or, or art that was made for that religion. The, the type of art and the type of architecture that was made for, for Islamic, as we thought, was used in homes, mm -hmm. in, in, in churches, in mosques, in bathhouses, everywhere. It was based on that, on that city or that area mm -hmm. in that period of time. For them to put them all under one big umbrella mm -hmm. is just unfair. You know, so that's why they, when they talk to you, they, they truly think you come from a tent. So why, you know? No, but I think, you know, I think a lot of designers actually, they just give in to that. It's just easier, you know, to do these kinds of things which are like, Because oh, it markets bucks. well when you compartmentalize. Exactly. But also people True. self, self, I also use this word and someone told me it was an actual word, so I'm gonna use it now. So, uh, people self-orientalize a lot. That is a word. They, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. a word. Yeah. So yeah. They, it, people actually, they make themselves this formula. Because that you're marketing to a Western audience. Correct. When you do that, that yeah. sells. But, but even, the peop even the locals, mm -hmm. why do that? Mm. Why self-orientalize in your own country? Like, no one's going to say you're less Kuwaiti if you do that, you know? It's but, but there is a, there, I think there's a, a level of saturation, and I think that we're mm. getting, we've gotten to that saturation. Um, in what? In terms of the orientalizing or self-orientalizing. I do think that's a fact. And again, um, when people see my work, especially the, um, the bead-embroidered work, I don't think they say, mm -hmm. um, well, they, I don't think they say it's Arab, but like with the beaded collars, I mean, I took inspiration, historic, uh, direct historic inspiration from the beaded collars of the pharaohs. It's very specific, it's very particular. But I don't think people will see that work and say that's the work of, you know, a Kuwaiti Arab, you no, know, they're et, not cetera, even et cetera, et cetera. The pharaohs. Um, well, I meant geographically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in saying that, uh, I do think that um, now we have been seeing a kind of flourishing and flowering of the arts uh, and creative industries in Kuwait. And I also think that we need to give it time. We need to give it time mm -hmm. for, it, for, for people to, to go through e you know, e everyone's own journey and, then, and, and the narratives will vary. Again, perfect segue into the broader topic of <laughs> this talk. No, 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 it's perfect. I'm loving this conversation. But what is the future of craftsmanship then, regionally and internationally? Oh, in your personal opinions. No one's going to judge. I, I'm, you know, again, I get a bit... I'm not very emotional about many things. <laughs> this is what I'm really emotional about. Uh, hence why we do this day in, day out. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's vital for humanity mm -hmm. and for our survival, not just our survival, but our thriving, um, um, let's say, how we want to really flourish and thrive is, is that we need to nurture uh, and invest in uh, the crafts. And that's one of the reasons why I was part of a group of people who co-authored, you know, um, what, what they call the Mutanahiya um, Tussagar. And we have a lot of our friends that we know and people where the studios are becoming assets rather than liabilities in our homes. We want to have one thing that I think is essential for us, and we can do this, I, I do believe in Kuwait with enough voices and enough lobbying. And we talked about this Ayyam al and Jamila and Farid, and we said, well, why don't we go and get some warehouses, and we don't need to have 150 coffee shops, just two, and maybe a place for people to work out, and something else, and then some, and have, they don't have to be cities, they don't have to be shiny, they don't have to be zone, but we need to have neighborhoods or clusters of places where we start creating the synergy. And we talked about it in those days. Remember, we said, 
Although we can get a bunch of warehouses. And so, so zoning um, or, or, or having places where those things can happen and it doesn't cost us an arm and a leg and two toes, um, where we can afford to make mistakes and to create and to, and to um, have people come into those zones and, and just work and just, you know, just get a few warehouses. Kuwait free trade zone is, is dying, mm -hmm. is already, you know, is, has expired a few times. Why don't, why don't, we, why don't we, you know, have a, four or five of those warehouses and then we'll, we'll even, we'll, yeah. not, not in phase two, I'm I, talking in phase even one. Actually, actually, um, I mean, using it as an example. No, no actually, the, stu the students, third year students at the Nabil Jama, they just did a project for Sawabar as what can we do with Sawabar. One of them was an artist colony. I mean, and it, and it was as just an as idea of what, what can we do. Um, if, if we don't bring in that type of education, in our system, where if kids don't sit down and start mm -hmm. working with their hands, um, they will not understand the whole um, preciousness of it. Yeah. That whole, that whole seductiveness. There's that a disconnect whole, between you, you the have, craft and, and, and then, the and artist. if they don't have that, it's unfair when they grow up to ask them to right. to uh, support to it one way or right. the other. You know, with with students of mine that that I. Them, I literally force them not to bring in the computer in the room, you know, mm -hmm. because they need to just sit down and draw. And then once they and they don't do CNC cutting, they have to cut models by hand, even though, you know, they cut fingers off mm -hmm. at some point. Look, I mean, but I mean, you know, it, it's it's it, it's something that needs to be enforced. Mm -hmm. If not because you know the 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 whole uh, idea of what crafts is and what's going to do, but because it's the sense of personal satisfaction yeah. that you get that you have done that right you know whether it was whether it was this or whether when, when we did the with Faye, the, the planting yeah. you know organic planting it's just the fact that you work with your hands mm -hmm. and then you see you see the the fruits of your labor yeah. literally mm -hmm. you know that i think is very important for for our psyche for you know for us to grow mm -hmm. more than anything else i mean i, I don't know how it is going to be uh, uh, internationally yeah, or, on, or on or uh, on market wise yeah. what's mm -hmm. going to sell and what's not but I, I believe it helps a lot on on the psychological level yeah. mm -hmm. I mean you know I, I have two points to say on that so mm -hmm. one if every single Kuwaiti uh, ended up working in finance when the oil runs out we would be left with nothing just keep that in mind keep that in mind these kinds of professions would just keep the keep the the cogs turning if we don't create we don't make something, leave a mark. When the oil runs out, we, don't, we won't have anything left. We have to become creative. We have had money for so long and nothing has come out of here. You know, we need to start innovation and innovation begins with creativity, whatever kind of creativity, but it needs, there needs to be. Yes, and this comes to my second point where I, I think like in, you know, to defend ourselves against AI and the robots in the future, we need to connect and we actually need to create. I think the condition of the human being is significantly reduced without some kind of, you don't need to create, you don't need to be a visionary, without skill physical, actually doing something with your hands, because this is one of the conditions of humanity. One of the only factors that separates us from the rest of uh, the beings alive in this world is our ability to actually create, to reorganize, to create systems, to, to make, to shape. Some other animals like ants, they do have this capacity, but it's quite limited, you know, but I think this is fundamental to preserving our humanity. Have you ever like gone, sat on your couch and you were on Instagram and you were like, oh my God, you woke up like two and a half hours later from your Instagram reverie and you had no idea what happened and you realized, oh my God, this was two and a half hours where I was just a total zombie. Imagine that's you the entire day. Once our lives become totally digitized, then we will no longer have we will lose our humanity. Once we no longer do anything with our hands, we abdicate all of our responsibility to create in this world to computers because they do it better. We're losing everything that we are. I think we need to keep what we are in, perspe in perspective. When we, um, 
when we think about how we want to like continue to exercise our humanity in this world this is number one this is like my own more um like bigger ideas but um i think that in this world uh, craft industries cannot survive without being commercially viable that's a great close for tonight's talk thank you thank um, you we'd like to turn the floor on to the audience and does anyone have a question anything keep it spicy <laughs> say whatever you want um, uh, hi my name is Maha and my question would be regarding the like the warehouse that we were you were talking about I think in Kuwait we are always depending on the government to provide everything and all what we need is like a community and one person take an action and and once we have that things will change because kids like the young like the young kids will go there so who will take an action or, or how can we make this happen well um, the folks I'm just talking from our standpoint uh, we were welcomed into uh, DAI Yarmouk uh, under extraordinary circumstances and if Mohammed and I had our way we'd end up taking over half of it and this, alhamdulillah yani Sheikh Hassan Farah are holding controlling our, our expansionary um, um, ideas an old school and saying that and going back to the time issue I mean we've got uh, like a we've got a three-day workshop where it's actually 12 hours in the beginning people say wow 12 hours that's a lot you can't use your phone you can't use your phone on the torch you know you want to make a call you go out and then uh, like two days later they're like and we're like, yalla, we have to close up and leave. And they're like, bidena. we just started with what's going on. And that's another thing. The design process and the crafting process, the making process, it's being bifurcated and interrupted because of digital technology. Even ahna, as, as we're working, we're not working like we used to, like one fell swoop or you've got one or two, three hours. I'm experiencing that again, you know, with, with the various applications. But um, if, if somebody has a warehouse, Let's do it. Let's do it. A warehouse. Money. No, oh. no. A warehouse. <laughs> that, that, that's equal to money. Yeah. Yes, but maybe we have <laughs> friends here who have a warehouse. I had a lot of knowledge about arts and like what would be needed for a space and how to organize the space. We had a location uh, for a whole entire year. We tried getting a license for that place. Perfect location. It's not going to impose any like danger to anyone or any difficulty, but the licenses at the time did not allow it to happen there. Like we would be shut down. Yeah, there's so much red Because tape. of the location. So when we asked them where could we find, it was always in Fahil, it was in somewhere industrial mm -hmm. where the warehouses cost like Terakwit like imposes a lot of cost on you. Yeah, tens of thousands just for the square meter to create such a space. And we had that space available for us, but we couldn't use that. We tried to look elsewhere. The rent was... And distance for anybody to get there was also like a problem. So this is why people still keep turning back to the government to ask mm. because we still need favors for them. We still need mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You need 25,000 papers just to get yourself somewhere where you would have to prepare another 40,000 papers. And that's, listen, that's okay. That's fine. But the physical location mm. is difficult exactly. to find in mm -hmm. Kuwait. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with that, their, their knowledge with arts and crafts and um, hand working is still somewhat limited to what it actually needs, that space that it actually needs, the facilities, the tools, um, the liability that it might have. So, for example, when I first started, um, an entity was very supportive and they asked me, what do you want? We'll give you anything you want. We'll give you a 3D printer. I told them I would like a space for lots of people so I can have a community of artists. I, they're mm -hmm. like, no, we do something for you only. Yeah. Yeah. This is the I mean, but, uh, but again, when we started the Department of Architecture 21 yeah. years ago, 
a university used to shut down Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah. Okay, so you can get to your own studio at university two days a week. And, and then the rest of the, of, the, of the week, you have to leave university by nine, okay? It took us about 15, 16 years to get Saturdays to work. So now, now I mean a little bit less, but it took us a year, I mean, now we have Saturdays studios and you, they close at midnight, not nine o'clock. No, 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 I'm, no, just no. Need, I'm, I'm just I'm saying you. we need to work in a particular direction. Yeah. And we, t we need to work with the government and we need to ask them yeah. because if, if the law does not exist, because it ha nothing has happened like this before, if something exactly. new is we coming up. We have to up, start demanding. You, you have, you have, you have, a new law needs to come up, a new, a new, a new license. I mean, you can't, you, can't, you can't go into the middle of, of a zoned area that's zoned for, let's say, uh, uh, residential and decided, you know what, I'm going to do a... a uh, a wood shop here, mm. you know. So, so on one hand, I mean, you have you have to work with the government. On the other hand, you have to initiate and and uh, instigate new new laws and new and new regulations. Yeah, because the government but keeps saying, saying that, yeah. yeah, sorry, but saying that, uh, so many of our friends who are carpenters have converted their basements and you know soundproofed them, and they're huge and they're doing amazing work. So I think sometimes, a, a lot of times, with the pain, you have innovation. Two things, we rented a space uh, in Fahil Hirafi through Hay Amu Sana'a, and it was Fahil, and I had to go to Fahil, and, and again, it wasn't, it wasn't really conducive, and then we closed it up. However, what is, has happened, our favorite friends at the National Fund, Mechalef, mm. but the National Fund instigated a conversation and said to Wada Real Estate, you folks have all of these lands and they called in AGI, and they called in a lot of entrepreneurs in different areas, and they had a focus group. Uh, and the idea has been, this was about two years ago, that they were going to design areas that were going to be um, creative industry zones. So there has been discussion. What I think we need to do is, is we need to call our National Assembly members, each and every one of us, or go in as a group and mm. start speaking about this. Mm. Not just now, but continuously because say. It, because it doesn't exist. Speak, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and say, نحتاج تشريع وقانوني ديد للصناعات البداعية. And to continuously, but if we don't knock on, on, on their doors, uh, and then, then, then they're going to think that everything is great and what they're doing is, is perfect. But the, uh, the issue is, is they are designing solutions, but they're not asking us what we need. Because a creative industry, look, it can't survive in a vacuum. I can't be like creative by myself. What la wow, super mobdi. No. Look at, for example, Dubai, okay? I talk about this comparison all the time. They have a greater chance of success. I'm not saying it's not hard in Dubai to succeed in fashion, but because they literally have the design district and the magazines are right there too. It's all the designers, it's the fashion designers, it's the magazine, it's the media people. They're all in the same place, mingling, going to the same coffee shops, interacting with each other, helping each other out. There are, and there are all the initiatives for creative in in industries happen in that place as well. That they have access, they have the knowledge, they know what prizes are coming up, they know what they can apply to, they know. It's literally in the, phys the same physical place. Exactly. Yeah. But exactly, we need to pressure, look, we need to pressure the government. At the end of the day, if they feel that there is no pressure, look how many scandals happened in Kuwait where they said, oh, Rahan Qasas, X, Y, Z, Ma Qasasahum, because there was no public outcry. On, yeah. like, any, why do I need a, uh, an office in Kuwait? Yeah. Why do I pay every month? I pay for this random office that I don't even need. Yeah. And then, I mean, maybe don't record this, but uh, I had, you know, a government. Okay, that's fine. I, I, it doesn't matter, but like basically, I don't need an office, and why do I need to pay? It starts with those regulations. We yeah, need to it change starts the policies because first. that that's a huge. They're hemorrhage. archaic. They don't work for the community now. Yeah, and there is a sense of disconnect within the creative community as well. We do need to come together. Yeah, it's because also people, yeah. people, especially here in the creative community, not all. Taban, there are lots of wonderful people who want to share, mm. but. I feel like there is still on a certain on a certain level, yani, a mentality of, oh, that's my competition. You can't, you know. Mm. But you, you have to understand, look, you're not going to survive without yeah. them. You're really not. Like, I've, I've actually offered, my, I mean, I've been in this industry five years. 
I, I know the ins and outs, يعني, internationally. Mm. Um, and um, I know how a lot of things down to the granular level work. Mm. And I've had a lot of, you know, even friends of friends or whatever, Kuwaiti girls come up to me and ask me, you know, like, oh yeah, like, I want to do this, whatever. And, and I'm, I'd be like, yeah, if you need help, like, just contact mm-hmm. me. It's all right, I hired someone for them. Right. Really? The that person's station. just going to exactly. lie to you until they that take station. your money, so... Yeah. Interfaces, technologically speaking, so can come in other ways. But also mentality. Yeah. I mean, change your mentality. Right. Believe right. me, you're not, like, I've been around five years. Yeah. You're not going to, like, become my competition overnight. Right. I'm happy to help. And even if you do, let the best man win. Exactly. You have to have this kind no, of mentality. No, but you have to risk the other side. Yeah. No matter what you do. I mean, there's nice. yeah, no, it's, it's mine. But, but you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Some people. Right. Yeah, but the other <laughs> thing I think is very important, and I, I think that's what we were talking about, you know, saying and what let's you mentioned. Wrap it up, let's we'll wrap it up course. quickly. <laughs> and saying, you know, you know, we want the government to. But the reason being is it's because all of the real estate assets are, are, we have a landlock. However, saying that, it's not that we're looking for recognition, because if anyone's looking for recognition from anyone, don't do what you're doing. You feed your own. Let me go. No, there's no تقدير. قدر نفسك. قيم نفسك. Build it. Do the work. Don't pussyfoot around it and say, "Ah, ما قدروني." If you're looking for تقدير خارجي, then you're not in. The, you're not. It's it's not the right objective. Mm-hmm. Again, going back to what you were saying. So do it because you feel that fire in your gut. And do it well. And there is exactly and nurture nurture what you have. But do it because you feel that fire in your gut and there isn't anything else you can do. Yeah. Don't do it for the glamour. Like, that's the, just, you're going to fail. What an inspirational way to end this. Thank you, guys. <laughs> 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 Thank you for coming out, everyone. <laughs>